start off by introducing myself to folks that don't know me. I'm Peter Wesley. I'm a faculty member in Department of Fisheries at UAF. I'm a PI on a major portion of this work, a co-PI on another portion of the work. I've known a lot of you, and it just it feels really good to be here to start sort of sharing what we've been working on for two years or so at this point. So what I wanted to do was start off, and my students that have had to suffer through any of my classes will have seen this. And I wanted to start off with this because I circle back to this thinking about in terms of sustainability, what, what's the currency and what ought we be trying to sustain when thinking about the Alaska salmon system or fisheries in general? And I honestly, the hardest thing about this project is that this has made me confront some of my own deep beliefs about this issue. And that for me, teaching this, thinking about it, thinking about what we ought to be sustaining in terms of connections between resources, governance, economies, and culture. Those are great subjects for sustainability, and I think it is right. This is from Art McAvoy's work and others. But for me, as a trained natural scientist, I, I always come back to thinking about the sustainability really is about the resource. That we can talk about the connections, and that's nice, but it circles back. It's about the habitat. It's about the resources. And this project, and thankfully working with a group of really skilled uh, social scientists has made me really challenge some of that. And I wanted to speak towards the subtitle of my talk, which was the setting the stage for an exceptional session. So it's not my prediction about how good the talks are gonna be, even though I think they will be. But this idea of exceptionalism in Alaska being exceptional is really what I've sort of had to be wrestling with and coming to grips with. Because in lots of ways, I think Alaska is exceptional. In other ways, I think there's some hard truths that we need to be looking at very closely. So thinking about connections, what are sort of the status of connections between salmon and people in Alaska currently? And it's kind of cool that we actually know because we've asked people how connected they are to salmon. So friends and colleagues at the Salmon Project and now Salmon Life has actually asked Alaskans in a very well-balanced, statistically valid survey, well, how connected are you to salmon? And a full, you know, 75% of Alaskans are either very connected or somewhat connected to salmon as a natural resource. And then 13% are not very connected, 11% are not, and then the others have no idea whatsoever. But this is fairly exceptional and off the charts in terms of a natural resource that as Alaskans, we share this connection to salmon still. And when asked, sort of complimentary, about 75% also think that salmon are really very important to the state and to people's lives. And so we still have this connection in Alaska. And that is exceptional. We don't have to go that far to the south to look to places where those connections have been severed. So there's a picture of members of the Yurok tribe on the Klamath the last few years being faced with a really hard choice of whether for your ceremonies for first fish and so forth in the season, do you serve hamburgers or hot dogs, or do you bring in salmon from Alaska? Because there are no Chinook left to catch in the Klamath. Mm -hmm. And so last year they chose to bring fish from Alaska for this ceremony, but as they were saying, you know, nobody likes serving salmon with a disclaimer that it came from somewhere else. Alaska is still fairly exceptional in that at its core that there is a lot of intact habitat left that is sort of the center and for me circles back to being the hallmark of what is so important for sustaining. And that is true. And we know a lot about that and the abundance of fish because there's been a pile of work for a long time of tribes, agencies, NGOs, the state to be quantifying this, measuring fish abundance, sizes, age, and it's really rich. Alaska is exceptional in just how much salmon habitat there is. So this is a map working on the regions that we've been working at across the state. That network of rivers is not all the available rivers and waters in the state. These are the rivers that are known to have salmon in them. Okay? So those are known to have salmon in them, and we know that because it's been documented. So people have been out on the streams documenting the presence of salmon in these streams. There's a whole session in the symposium about the importance of documenting anadromous waters and of course the connections to policy. So just how much salmon habitat do we have documented? And we know it's a vast underestimate, probably in the vicinity of 30% in lots of regions probably are documented. Lots more left to be done. But just how much is it? 
Well, somewhere around 120,000 kilometers, so that's somewhere around three times the Earth of how much salmon habitat there is. So off the charts compared to other places. And these habitats still exist as a really complex mosaic of conditions. So these are air temperatures across the state, lots of variability ranging from relatively warm to relatively cool on the north slope. And this variability anchors salmon to place, that they are locally adapted to these places, return with high fidelity to these places, and they anchor the people to these places. So people are still in place harvesting fish the way they have for millennia. It's a picture from the Yukon River. And these fish provide other values as well. So rather than nutrients flowing downstream to the sea, the fish swim these nutrients that they've gained in the ocean back upstream where they die, deposit those nutrients with ecosystem impacts. I've been talking about that in other sessions at this meeting. But also, more directly, we know that that subsidy of salmon resource has direct, very key benefits to resident species like rainbow trout, arctic char, and grayling. So these habitats are intact and diverse, and we can see that diversity played out in things like the age at which smolts go to the ocean. So aging at zero, one, or two, and the consequences of that life history diversity. We're going to, have to be talking about that life history diversity in various talks tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon in particular. There's variation in the adults that are adapted to place. From a picture from some beaches and streams in Bristol Bay where sockeye are spawning in different habitats and that they mirror and reflect the habitats in which they are grounded, where fish in the beach are large, heavy for their length, deep-bodied, avoiding predation by bears but are selected by sexual selection to show that sort of morphology in contrast to fish that spawn in creeks where they're susceptible to being eaten by a bear and so show that morphology of being small and skinny, well suited and well grounded to place. And so even though the fish are grounded on the landscape in place, they share a common ocean. So these are high seas tag recoveries. The colors are where the fish that were tagged in the ocean eventually were recovered back to the different regions. And so that smorgasbord of colors is essentially reflecting the fact that salmon of all regions are commingling in the ocean and sharing this same ocean. And we know from work from group members in our project, particularly Greg Ruggeroni and Pete Rand's group, people have been working on this, is that the ocean that these salmon now inhabit is really changing rapidly. And paradoxically, and thinking about the state of Alaska salmon, there are now more Alaska salmon, more salmon in the ocean. These are total salmon in the ocean now than there has been at least since the 1920s. There is at least, for some of the species, large contributions now of both hatchery and wild fish. And so there's more fish in the ocean, which raises questions about interactions for competition for food, uh, predator interactions, and all kinds of wonderful questions with unclear answers. But at the same time, more fish total in the ocean but of those three species, we know that there has been inequitable declines of different species in different regions where there are scarcity of some species. So on the Kuskokwim River and other places, Chinook are declining. And in some places, like the Kuskokwim could argue, they are slowly rebuilding. But it's not one state of Alaska salmon. It varies by species and it varies by region. And in Alaska in general, there's lots of fish, but in particular ties to Chinook salmon, this scarcity has played out and had major implications for people that are grounded in this place. This is a picture of my friend Ben at his fish camp in past years when Chinook salmon fishing was not permitted. And Ben was there sort of watching the net. Seems like he has a bit of a longing look on his face. And for better or for worse, and I think for worse, there's a tie of that scarcity across the state. It's a picture of a lovely troller I took in Petersburg recently where all inside waters are completely closed to any commercial fishing for Chinook salmon because of concerns about lack of abundance and scarcity. So it's something we share and the state of Alaska salmon, depending on species, is not universally strong. And the salmon themselves, I like to tease Ben again, photographic evidence that suggests that yes, the harvesters of the fish are getting older and grayer, but the fish they're catching are getting smaller and younger. So a picture on the left from Ben's fish camp about 20 years ago or so, and then a picture from last summer holding up a Chinook with his son Alex. 
So thinking about the state of the habitat, we could have a whole session on habitat, and indeed we are in this, in this session or in this, uh, in this conference. But what we can look at is essentially things like this that give an estimate of sort of the, the human footprint or signature of humans on the landscape in Alaska, where blue is essentially untouched or functionally pristine, with the yellow being some impact and red being high impact. And you know, you can see something along the rail belt, belt in Fairbanks and Fairbanks and, and the Matsu is a little red, but there's a lot of blue, and you don't have to look too far to look to, this, to the lower 48 to see that maybe that is our future. In Alaska, we've been largely free of things like this compared to lower 48 where issues like culvert and fish passage has been a major issue. But in Alaska, there are about 2,000 documented culverts in Alaska that we know of, certainly an underestimate, and about two-thirds of them are potential blockages or are known to be blockages of fish. So we have these issues, and I think we do ourselves, and I feel like I've been doing at least myself a disservice, thinking otherwise that the state of Alaska salmon is universally strong and we don't have these issues. So the purpose of this symposium and the purpose of this project in general, I could argue, is for us to take a hard look and think about what is the status of these relationships between the ecosystems and habitat and the economies and cultures and the system of laws and governance that ties all these things together, these dynamic and interacting connections. What are the health? What's the status of those relationships? Again, thinking that it's probably these relationships that are our currency that we are wanting to sustain. So in our symposium, I'm going to call it a symposium in four-part harmony. There's talks that I'm loosely grouping in things that I'm going to call big data and big ideas. Um, uh, and another one is a catch-all, equity, access, and participation. And then others that I'm calling data enlightened management, not implying that other management has not been enlightened by data, but it's sort of tapping into the power of big data to help make decisions. And then a catch all about Alaska in a changing world that we are part of a bigger system that is also rapidly changing with us. Talks bleed across categories. There's not a session that is only one type of talk or another. I leave it to you to decide whether a talk is a big idea, big data, or salmon in a changing world. Hopefully some of the things that I talked about today, hopefully were some big ideas and that you're intrigued. So I want to, hopefully that sets the stage. I'm really excited. I also want to say I'm thankful for the opportunity and deeply thankful to uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for the opportunity and to NC's National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, University of Santa Barbara, that's been sort of key allies of this from the get-go. So my name is Jeanette Clark. As Peter said, I'm the Projects Data Coordinator at NCES, which stands for the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. We're based in Santa Barbara. Um, and my talk today is about, it's called Salmon Synthesis, and it's um, using open science to integrate and analyze Alaskan salmon data. So basically in this talk, I'm going to um, introduce you to the sort of um, methodologies and ideas behind the way that I do the things, the way that I do all of this salmon data synthesis. So Peter's version of this was a little bit prettier, but it's pretty much the same thing, the triangle. So the, the challenge with, you know, with data synthesis in a project like this is that we're working across these three really broad and very different domains, sociocultural and economic, biophysical and governance, and all of them have different data, different types of data, and it presents a lot of challenges for, for data integration. Oops. But before I go too much further, I want to introduce everyone who's not already familiar to the concept of synthesis science. So NCES is a synthesis science center, and synthesis science is analyzing and integrating disparate data theories and methods to provide new insight. So the key thing to that is we, we aren't going out and collecting new data, we're using existing data for the entire project. And there's really good reason for us to do this in Alaska for, with regard to Alaskan salmon. And that's, um, as many of you are, are aware, there's a lot of data out there already being collected um, by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, by universities, by uh, local communities. Um, by the Commercial Fisheries Entry Commission. So there's a lot of data already out there. We don't need, especially me being from California, 
we don't need to go out and collect new data on salmon. We need to figure out how to use the data that we already have in a more efficient way to answer, ask and answer new questions. And so this is actually, as it turns out, really hard. So NCS has been running this working group model where we do synthesis science for a long time. And what we found is that a lot of the working groups will get together and they'll you know, talk a lot about the questions that they're going to ask of these great data sets that they're going to put together and you know, all these different caveats and like they have great ideas, but there's very little thought put into frequently, much less thought than there needs to be um, put into the like how do we actually, how are we going to actually bring all this data together? What are the skills that we need and how are we going to do the data integration? And so as part of the SASAP project, we got an additional source of funding that funded the data task force, um, which is to basically help with this, this data synthesis aspect. And so the data task force takes data that are in you know, Excel documents, plain text documents, relational databases, geospatial data, quantitative data, qualitative data, anything you could possibly think of, basically, and tries to make it um, into a slightly more coherent, less of a mess. And we have a lot of people who help us do this. So we have six full-time staff, not all of whom are full-time on the project, including myself, and Jared down there in the lower right-hand corner, who's going to be talking later today, um, and Jorge and Madeline. And then we have our three full-time data fellows. So these are recent master's graduates who help us do some of the more complicated data integration tasks. And I also have five uh, student interns who work with us. So it's a small army, this task force, that's charged with integrating all of this data. And the really key part of this is that and what I, what I really want to focus on is that we want to do, we don't want to just do the data integration. We want to do it in, in what I think of as the right way. So I want to do it in a way that is reproducible, in a way that's transparent, and so that anyone who wants to know how, what kind of decisions we made along the way, because you do have to make a lot of decisions when you do this kind of data integration, I want to be able to fully explain what these decisions are, how we implemented them, and why we made them. And so the steps for that are we want to make sure that we preserve all of the original data that we get. We want to be able to describe and track changes made to that data. We want to ensure that the data are of high quality, and we want to preserve all of the derived data products. So we're talking about creating this reproducible, transparent workflow. And all that starts with data collection. So that's basically requesting data from people. Our two primary sources of data are the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the Commercial Fisheries Entry Commission. And I have to pause here and thank Jen Shriver and Rich Brenner from those two organizations who have been immensely helpful in trying to get me the data that I need in order to get the working group members to stop emailing me. Um, <laughs> But we work with a lot of other data providers as well. We work, with, um, we work with the state, we work with federal agencies, we get data online from other data archives, we work with native councils, um, we work with universities. So there's, you know, behind my small army of people integrating this data is a much larger army of people who are, um, I'm very grateful, are, are providing the data. And what we do fr frequently looks kind of like this. So this is a simple example. These are two brood tables um, on the top and the bottom. You can tell just by glancing at them that they have sort of a similar format, but they're not exactly the same. And so if we want to look at trends between stocks, then we need to reformat these original files and turn them into one file, which in this case is fairly straightforward. But we do all this in this workflow that's, again, highly reproducible and transparent. So we start with our original data files, which remain unchanged from the state in which I get them. We use uh, the R programming language, language, and we use some tools within R. And I see some faces who've been to some of our trainings out here. So you're from the, those who have been to the SASAP trainings are familiar with these. But we use R Studio, and within R Studio, we use R Markdown and what's called the Tidyverse as basically a set of software tools um, to do this more efficiently. We then, 
create our derived data products, which notably we save everything in open source file formats so that the data products that we create will be available, um, you know, not just now, but, you know, 30, 50 years from now. And the tools that we, that we implement allow us to do what we call literate analysis. So I realize that this is sort of tiny on the left, but it's tiny for a reason. I don't want you to really read it. But um, really what we're trying to do is make sure to explain the code that we're writing so the code is in those blue chunks with, you know, real human understandable words. So we're creating these documents where we integrate the code and the explanation for the code in a very sort of visually appealing and easily understandable way. And all of that generates files which look, you know, much more clean and orderly than what we received. After we go through the data reformatting, we go into the quality control loop. Um, quality control is an iterative process. Again, we use R Markdown and um, ggplot to visualize our data, to find issues with it. The, if we find problems, that gets fed back into our processing scripts. And that, you know, sort of cycle is how we ensure that our data are of high quality. And again, all this is incorporated in a scripted environment. The original files are always preserved, and so we can always repeat anything that we do. Again, we try and do this in a literate way where we explain all of the problems that we find and how we fix them. We make plots. And quality control in particular presents some unique challenges. I'm not a salmon expert, but uh, looking at this, this is a subsample of our length data set, the year with the year on the x-axis and length on the y-axis, length in millimeters. So I'm not a salmon expert, but I'm pretty sure that there are no six meter salmon out there. So I can say that, you know, I'm pretty sure that this is an error in the data set and that we should not include this in analysis. But it turns out that um, to get the, those exact bounds right to figure out, well, like how big is a salmon? Like how big should a salmon be? What are reasonable values in this data set? We go through this very, lengthy process where we email a lot, we share figures, we go over things in person, all to get a chunk of code that looks something like this where we flag data that we think might not be quite right. And so then that figure turns into this where all the colored dots are data that are flagged for flagged in such a way that they can be easily filtered so you're not running analysis over that. And a really important thing that I want to point out here is that we don't remove anything from the data. We don't change the original data. We don't remove things from the data set. We flag things so that you can easily take them out of analysis. But by flagging things and not removing them, it enables future users to say, well, I think that that, you know, that there should, that definition of salmon length is ridiculous. Like, I want to put in my own subsetting criteria. Um, obviously, length maybe isn't the best example for this, but, um, it, uh, you know, this enables much more flexibility with our data for future users of the data. Another one of the unique challenges is scale. And so um, I've learned a lot about Alaska geography working on this project, but if I get a data set from Salmon River in the Kuskokwim drainage, the person who put that data set together may only work in the Kuskokwim drainage and may you know, everybody knows where, where that Salmon River is, but it turns out there's more than one Salmon River in Alaska. So one of the really challenging things that I have to deal with is making sure that um, I'm, that, you know, when I'm integrating data sets across this huge scale, across the state of Alaska, that these data may not have been collected with that intent. I have to make sure that, you know, I'm taught that the Salmon River in the data that I'm getting is the same Salmon River that I'm thinking of when you look at it from a statewide perspective. Another aspect of our reproducible workflow are all these scripts that we're generating. Um, we version them using a software called GitHub, Git, um, and host it online via GitHub so that we make sure that we don't end up with a data processing workflow that looks like this, where I have a different script for every day, for every data set. Um, you know, because I want to make sure that if I make changes to it, that I don't break something. Um, Git allows us to do this in a much more robust way, and it allows us to work together more efficiently. So what you're looking at here is basically the equivalent of this, which is uh, an actual screenshot from a colleague of mine's master's research. 
So every line here is a new version of the script. So again, as similar to the flagging situation, if I make a change in a data set, I send it to a working group member and they say, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? I can easily go back and say, okay, well, let me just go back to the version that was not bogus. Um, and it makes everything, again, much more reproducible and trackable, all these changes that we're making. Um, and this is just another visualization of what Git can do. So it can tell you what changes you're making line by line. The last aspect of this is that we bundle up this whole workflow and we want to archive it and make it public. So not only is everything reproducible, but one of our big missions is to make sure that not only all of our uh, derived data sets are publicly available, but all of our source data as well is as well. And we do this using the KNB Data Archive, the knowledge based network for biocomplexity. So this is what a source data package might look like. We have all of our original data files and some explanation about where they came from and who gave them to us. And then in the derived data, we can actually explicitly point to the linkage between the derived data and the original data. And if you go to knb.ecoinformatics.org and search for SASAP, you'll be able to see all of the publicly available SASAP data sets. We have quite a lot. We have 11 gigabytes of content and 68 data sets. I took the screenshot this morning. So you can see that our data usage, our downloads are starting to ramp up. Um, so I'm really excited about, you know, I get really excited about making data public, making data more available. There's so much out there, especially in the world of ecology and the world of salmon that's just tied up in old databases and old systems. And um, it makes me really excited to work on this project and be able to liberate some of that data and make it available for future users and that my, not only am I liberating the data itself, but liberating the process that, that, I, that I use to make that data. So being completely transparent about, about all of the data integration and all the data analysis that we do. So um, I want to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And I'm right on time, which I'm really excited about. And my acknowledgment slide I made purposely a little bit silly. Uh, for, I also have to thank the Department of Fish and Game and CFEC uh, for giving me so much data and just a logo bonanza of only a sample of some of the other people who've given us data. Um, really, I just have to thank anyone who's ever answered an email that I've sent them, um, particularly you know people who've answered that email with an attachment. Um, so thank you, and with that, we'll open it up for questions. Um, let me first kick off with, with a little bit of history about why we got into this. I don't think the creation story of SASAP, I've, I've had some conversations in corridors with folks about, so how did this all come to be and what's, it, what's different? What, what have you actually done that's different to what would have happened in absentia? Uh, but I'd like to focus and, and try and harness what we've learned along the way and particularly focus on where we're going to next with all this. I really want to think and, and perhaps invite your input to thinking about how do we take this incredible enterprise forward. So SASAP really began... Um, really from an assessment that was done near the end of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation's Wild Salmon Ecosystems Initiative, a very large effort over more than a dozen years, where they were trying to figure out what could they do as they transition away from that program. So I was asked to come in and help think about that strategy. And, and really, part of the challenge for Alaska and part of the challenge for any private funder or government funder in Alaska is that in Alaska we are perceived to be I hear the words in good shape relative to anywhere else in the world, and I've taken a little bit of putting Peter's map up there, going to share what the rest of the world looks like outside and what things look like inside. So in terms of perception of intactness, in terms of perception of systems that are functional, in terms of perception of a salmon system and, and salmon people that are in much better shape than any other salmon people and system in the rest of the world, that's part of the challenge we face. Uh, but there was clearly a need, as I talked to a lot of folks, there was a need for much more up-to-date information. If you try and Google, and, and do it for me, please, because I'd be curious to see how many million hits you get, Alaska salmon or Alaska people, any of those terms, you'll come up with a lot of information, but nothing, I guarantee, will meet your exact need right here and now. It's, it's all over the place, and it exists in all sorts of forms, it exists in all sorts of legacy data sets, it exists in all sorts of legacy publications. And perhaps 
not unsurprisingly, but importantly for folks who fund this stuff, there is a, there's actually no coherent Alaska salmon research agenda. There's no list of saying top 10 things that are important to know about salmon. Extraordinary, isn't it? This, this amazing enterprise you've heard so much about in the state. So there's really, through the process of, of developing this, this synthesis work, we had the opportunity to engage with ENSIS, who are pretty widely regarded as the premier National Synthesis Science Centre, and to really actively link the ENSIS um, systems with Alaska science institutions and, and indigenous knowledge, which is really quite a novel enterprise. ENSIS have begun to do other work in Alaska. They've got the Arctic Data Synthesis Centre. They've done some of the Exxon Valdez work. But really, we have not had historically a great capacity within Alaska to do synthesis work of this scale. So there was that opportunity. In a lot of folks' minds, still, a lot of folks had just read, partly because of the Salmon Project, they'd sent copies of this book around the state very widely. I think in every community in Alaska, Gail, I'm looking at you, you've probably seen copies of this laying out in villages in rural Alaska. The King of Fish, David Montgomery's book, came out. And, and the themes that resonated with people, I heard often in that conversation, how do we write the last chapter of this book? You know, how, how do we actually go away from this general trend where under human influence as the landscape gradually evolved right out from under Salmon? And we saw some of that in Kui and Severine's presentation just then. I also came across a lot of folks who, despite the general perception that salmon are in good shape in Alaska, have experienced salmon loss. And, and there's a term that's being pretty widely used now, invented by a guy called Glenn Olbrecht, called solastalgia, which is an existential melancholia experienced with a negative transformation or desolation of a loved home environment. And there's many at attributes of that that uh, uh, Courtney and Jessica and other folks have begun to explore in their work on the wellbeing side. And I saw some of that in Japan. I was there recently, uh, where there are entire salmon systems that no longer exist, no longer exist. But people put up signs to reflect on the fact that these were the values that their parents and their grandparents enjoyed. Sarah, our, uh, our co colleague in the corner, was recently in Scotland as part of the International Year of Salmon, and she actually experienced the the, the very deep emotional connection people had to salmon that are no longer there, and and the grief they suffer through that process. And then, of course, there's the old bogeyman money. Um, you know, it really is quite an extraordinary tale right now, what's happened in Alaska in terms of opportunities to fund this kind of work. If I take just one example, uh, this is the Alaska Sustainable Salmon Fund, which at its peak was around $25 million a year. Last year, that fund had about $4 million available to that. And not all of that $4 million is available for extramural funding. So we are really in a, a perfect storm, as I said to some folks from NOAA visiting yesterday, in terms of access to the kind of work that's needed to sustain a viable salmon system through research enterprises. I also was very struck by this quote. Charles Walford is an old mate, and um, Charles writes an opinion piece for the Anchorage Daily News. He was talking his reflections on the state budget session that just finished, and, and I thought this quote really captured the mood and the moment in the state right now. We are really a fractured state without the collective will to prepare for the new world that we are entering. Does that quote resonate with anyone else? If you've followed, if you've tried to have a conversation with an Alaskan politician about climate change, if you've tried to have a conversation with a, a, a developer, a private developer here in Alaska in the resource sector about things like economic diversification, all these issues come to the forefront pretty quickly. So when I look at what we did in terms of the roadmap we, we set out upon, and I look at all the, all the characters, uh, it's okay, Bert had a copy of his baby in this picture, I've got a copy of my little baby, bottom left hand corner, little bear, he'd like to have been with us today. He did make a contribution, I believe. Um, when I look back at what we set out to achieve in this process, um, and I'll zip through this animation pretty quickly, but it really was a, a fairly complex process of design development, going from how do we kick this off, how do we actually make it possible for these synthesis groups to come together, uh, to then adding in, because at the outset of this project, you've heard a lot about the amazing work Jeanette and Jared and other folks have done in this process, the data task force. That wasn't actually part of the original SACEP design, but that came along later, so we had to retrofit about a year into the process, which was a wonderful opportunity, I might add, but it, it proved to challenge us in terms of synchrony. And then we had to really figure out ways to engage this and take it forward, and, and, and what do these sort of sharing opportunities look like. So it's a fairly complex process. I won't get into all the details of that. You've seen in various ways the way that the project was structured. You've seen the, the round one groups, for want of a better term, are really the groups who are looking at the statewide synthesis scale, the work being led by Peter with a whole bunch of other folks that really looks at that big picture of Alaska. And then the more specialised groups from, that you've heard about from Michael and Eric and, and Rachel and, and others where you've drilled down on specific topics 
and, and keeping that all sort of moving forward in a sort of coherent way, dealing with all the things that come up in people's lives, dealing with all the things that come and go, uh, has been a, a fascinating process. But one of the things I'm most pleased by, and it really harks back to the call of yesterday's plenary session when the president of AFS challenged us all in relation to our diversity, um, we really have brought together an extraordinary array of, of people, including, I might add, Canadians. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Brendan's not in the room, I, I was going to, I, that was for him. Um, but really quite an extraordinary range of, of folks and I might have, and he's, is Charlie here? He was here a moment ago. But um, we've had, oh here, sorry, see you there. We've also got alongside this effort a, a group of data ethnographers looking at how the data process has worked in, within this process and how it might work beyond that in terms of the culture of data application. So really quite an extraordinary range of disciplines and diversity. And I want to just reflect on a moment about the importance of this diverse approach to salmon science and synthesis. Um, there's a lot of things that are different about SASAP. Um, first up, uh, we did something which was very un like We actually ramped up things very quickly, or relatively quickly. Uh, we, we did a quick start. We actually commissioned the round one groups. We didn't go through the whole proposal process. Secondly, we made a conscious effort to deeply engage and consistently engage indigenous and academic experts. And you'll see this for the first time, and NCs, NCs have done over 550 synthesis projects. This is the first time there's been that conscious effort to actively engage indigenous knowledge in an equal way with classic academic science. Um, I'm unusual, I guess I'm a private sector person, I guess, um, but having me involved as a networker, part of my role in this whole process has been to connect to SASAP concurrently, not just wait till the very end and then bolt on the connections with people, but throughout the process to engage people. So I've had the good fortune of being able to talk with the governor, being able to talk with elected representatives at the federal level, at local levels, private sector, a whole range of folks to connect them with this work and keep them excited about what's happening. And there are a lot of fans out there who have been tracking the work we're doing. Um, bridging, I mentioned earlier, the California-Alaska connection, the, the NCS connection, really hoping that we can pick up some of the capacity that NCS has generated in California and bring that into Alaska. Um, the data task force, really testing that hypothesis, just how much more incrementally efficient is a synthesis process when you have that level of data support available. And I think we've heard in the many accolades of, of the data team in the last couple of days how valuable that's been. Um, we've also had very close engagement with community partners, and particularly I'll mention the Salmon Fellows, and dedicated outreach funding and support. Along the way, we've been able to do a lot of things. I think, I was going to put a figure up, but I think it was over 22 presentations to various conferences in Alaska the last two years, and we just doubled that, of course, in the last day. There's been 20 in the last two days alliance. So that was quite extraordinary. And then finally, um, a very active dialogue. You can imagine when someone comes in and borrows, you, borrows your data, when you go and talk to groups like ADF&G or Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, how potentially threatening that is. So that, that's that been a very nuanced, com a, a bit, but a very complex partnership and, and a very valuable one. Along the way, things didn't always go as planned. I, I love Lunik, the way life was supposed to be, the way, way life is actually, and the messy sign. Um, you know, the project took a lot longer to ramp up. I won't talk about university contracting systems, but, but you know, when you pick a number, double it. And then maybe double it again, depending on which university. Inside Alaska, the latter. Outside Alaska, the former. You synchronised the data task force and CSAP. I've talked about that. Um, trying to secure some additional funding. We've been very fortunate. We've raised some additional money along the way, but there really isn't at the present time a prospect of significant funding to continue further CSAP groups in this current format unless we find a new beneficiary. Um, getting information into the hands of decision makers is always a very challenging task and we're really trying, as, as QE and Severine just showed then, to find ways to make that happen at multiple scales. Um, th it is challenging to talk about issues like equity in salmon in Alaska. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of mistrust, there's a lot of people who really like the system the way it is. It works for them. So why would you change it? Why would you have these difficult conversations? Why would you point out the things that Steve Langdon pointed out last night? Um, and then, of course, the ability of SASAP to live on in data processing. A lot of the, the concern we had in generating this vast data, data effort was that the data systems themselves would not be continued by organisations. That's proven to be a, a, an ongoing challenge. So those are some of the things. But I would point out along the ways you've seen we've really generated some extraordinary new insights. So those of you who have sat through the last 19 presentations have seen some just amazing analyses. The first time we've ever been able to look at salmon in the way, salmon and people in the way that we've begun to look at them. Look at this graph that Steve Langdon shared with you again yesterday. 
showing you how decisions get made in the board of fish, an enormous amount of data that went into that analysis through people like Megan Cooper and Molly McCarty. But it shows that basically the decision making process is, is weighted towards institutional interests currently. If you're an individual before the board of fish, and I see Gail nodding ahead, she's been there, um, it's much harder. We've now been able to show the extent of that bias and that, that, that challenge. We've got new conceptual frameworks. I mean, I, I tweeted yesterday Courtney's definition and, and Rachel's definition of, of well-being, the group, and uh, that's been I think my, my, one of my most properly retweeted tweets in a long time. It's extraordinary, the interest of the community at large. If you can imagine, I was in New Zealand recently, the New Zealand Prime Minister is elected on a platform of trying to find a way other than GDP of measuring well-being in New Zealand. And she, I know the New Zealand folks are very interested in, in this work. Um, so new conceptual frameworks, new tools, and, and it's a pity Toby's not here to see, um, I've got his circular graph, but I mean, to, to, to look at the way we've been able to visualise flows of benefits and goods and services, both within and between systems, uh, in these sort of ways is extraordinary. And the ability, as Jared showed us, to actually start to understand river systems and, and connections. Finally, the, the connections and cultures of collaboration, um, you know, We've done both a lot of internal connecting, and, and I think you'll find the 120 or so people involved in ZSAP are now probably almost family in terms of their ability to connect and work with each other in future. But also outside of that, we've actually made an effort to reach out to groups. Here was a booth we manned at the um, Alaska Federation of Native meeting, and, and we've got a lot of people out there now very eagerly anticipating what's coming out of ZSAP. So let's look to the future very briefly as I wrap up. and, and um, one thing I, I want to emphasise is that, is that not only did we learn a lot, but we also, um, we've also positioned ourselves to learn a lot more in the future. Um, we've actually helped generate, I think, last count about 25, but more than 25, either students or early stage scientists who are going to carry the legacy of this work forward. And as you've seen, nearly all of them, courtesy of, of people like Madeline and Matt Jones and Jared and others who have been teaching people R, have got the ability to, to now take these massive data sets and, and take them forward in ways that could never have been done, perhaps before in Alaska. Perhaps they could have been, but I think we've certainly added to the, to the, the, the constituency or at least the capacity overall of institutions and, and organisations to carry that work forward. We also are hoping through this process to really make deeper and stronger connections with Alaska salmon advocates. I mean, ultimately, if nothing happens as a result of SASAP, then it will have been a waste of time. Okay? If we just write papers out of this, and I know papers are important to academics and we build the knowledge, I'm not diminishing the importance of papers, but I'm, I'm emphasising the importance of something happening as a result of this work. And so finding ways to share this information in ways that, that, that salmon advocates can use and take forward is important. So we are finding all sorts of ways now to take the scientific papers that are going to flow out of, out of, ENS, out of SASAP over the next couple of years and convert those into ways that are practically useful to people who are advocates for salmon whether it be through things like the Wild Salmon book that we're republishing with, with the contract assistance currently, we're informing that with SASAP products, all the way through to a, a much more uh, exciting and, and dynamic website and other platforms like Storybook that we'll make accessible to people so they can find information much more easily than the standard Google search. So there's a very systematic approach there. But I guess equally importantly, there's, there's also a range of engagement processes that, that have begun from the local scale to the, the global scale we have begun to get involved with the International Year of the Salmon. In fact, a number of folks have connected uh, SASAP to that process and that will strengthen that relationship between salmon and these international uh, 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 agents. There's also a fairly strong private sector engagement. I've been able to interest a lot of folks in a, a range of fishery sectors to uh, really consider evaluating in different ways the Alaskan economy through sharing some of the work of SASAP and there's actually a fund being developed that may build on some of this work. There was a very strong fish-first policy in the walker Malot administration's platform as they came in, which has really been not activated to the extent people thought it might be. And so as the election ramps up later on this year, I will be spending, and others I know amongst you, more time in that advocacy. Um, the work we're doing with ADF and G uh, in terms of agency engagement, just again, I can't thank the agency enough for their collaboration, their active engagement in this process. The fact that we've got people like Bert Lewis and other, other science staff in the agency actively involved in this process has really added to the internal ability to communicate what SASAP's all about. And then finally, and, and not lastly, I don't see any in the room currently, are there any salmon, fe salmon fellows? There were a couple here yesterday, but for those of you who are not aware, there is a salmon fellowship program where there are currently 32 salmon fellows who are becoming champions for salmon. And our 
one of our key targets at, at SASAP is to work with them to actually spend some time with them face to face and really help them understand how to use the SASAP work. So that's a lot to digest, a um, lot to cover, but thank you, and let's see if there's any questions. <laughs>